Hey, Inspired Moneymaker. Today, we're talking about investing money in business with one of the best investors that I know. <laughs> Episode 219 features Mariko Gordon, prudent investor and business mentor. doesn't matter like how right your math is or, or whatever, like the market is telling you something. It may be temporarily wrong in the market, or you may be wrong. But if you're sure you're right, you're not going to bother to find out why. Because when you find out why, with a truly open mind, that's when you know whether you should buy the Jesus out of it at eight bucks, or whether you should be cutting your losses and running. But if you do it from the place of I'm wrong and the market's wrong, you know, Mr. Market is designed to give the maximum number of people the maximum amount of pain. <laughs> I'm Andy Wong, host of the Inspired Money Podcast and financial advisor at Running Mead Capital Management. Our guest today is my friend Mariko Gordon. She's a poet, hypnotist, and hula dancer. One of her high school classmates was Barry, who's now known as Barack Obama. I'm not going to ask her about any of that, though. I invited Mariko on because she's a smart investor who built a $2.5 billion money management firm from scratch. Today she mentors women and says you can run your business, your finances, and your life on your own terms. In this episode you'll learn investing insights from a professional portfolio manager, how to invest like a girl, and beat the pants off the guys, and tune in to the end to hear about burnout and why Mariko closed her business. Now let's get inspired with Mariko Gordon. Mariko, welcome to Inspired Money. I'm so excited to have you on the show. Well, I am too. This is like old home week, getting to catch up with you. Let's jump right in. What's your earliest childhood memory of money? So my earliest one is actually losing money, literally. Um, and it was a lot of money. Um, I don't remember exactly how much. I think I was pretty young, but I had, I just remember like being given a bill uh, and this was in the French Caribbean, so it was like, you know, francs, maybe it was 100 francs. I have no idea what the what it was. But for some reason, I had it, and then I didn't have it anymore. Like, I lost it. Like, I don't know how, you know, as I said, I think I was pretty young. Uh, and so that was my first memory of money, is like not paying attention and losing it. And then being really afraid, like, oh, my God. What do I do? And my parents are actually really cool about that. So I remember more the terror of the realization that I had something that I was supposed to hang on to, and I didn't. Um, but the, the sort of, that realization was kind of worse than the, the consequences. So maybe my parents are too easy on me. I don't know. Do you think that had a lasting, or did that make a lasting impression on your relationship with money? Ah, uh, that's interesting. Like, easy come, easy go. <laughs> um, I think it does, it does sort of raise some questions around what is the right stewardship towards money and your wealth. And I would say I've been really good at making a lot of money for clients um, over my career. Um, and, you know, did, did really well, did really well financially and so on. And yet, right, and yet um, my stewardship of my personal wealth and my family's wealth could have been so much better. And I have a lot of friends who are great investors who kind of have the same problem because it's not just your portfolio. It's kind of how you handle everything else, right? You know, your business arrangements, your divorce, your, you know, whatever. And, and so... Um, so I think it's interesting because I think how you steward your money says a lot about how you feel about yourself, I think. And, and, and it's really, um, it's an interesting tell. So it's something I've been thinking a lot about. Hmm. That's super interesting because it really goes to show that handling your money, it's not just about investing it. It's not just, you know, like there are so many different layers and dimensions. I noticed that your Twitter account in all caps says money is, mis no, money is not mysterious. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I, uh, I really believe that. Like I, I, I think people 
So I, I have a lot of friends who are artists and poets and writers, and and um, and then I also know people, you know, from Wall Street, and I really went out of my way to kind of have an anti Wall Street Wall Street firm, um, and so I'm really familiar with the two kind of extreme mindsets around money, right? There's one extreme that are kind of like the Ferengi in Star Trek, you know, very feral capitalism. And then the other extreme is, oh my God, you know, money is evil and everything else. And money is just, it's just a tangible representation of an energetic exchange, right? So, um, uh, anyway, I, I think I just went, <laughs> I just, I think I just went way off topic right there. But I really feel that there's, there's, there's a lot of hangups around money and it, it's this mysterious thing. Like how do you make it? How do you grow it? Uh, and it's like loaded. It's like powerful. It's either because it's evil or it's powerful because you really want it. And you know, it's like a hungry ghost. So it's either something to like be in opposition to and rebel against, or it's something that you like, you know, can become so compelled to drawn to that it's, it's kind of unhealthy. Right. So for me, money is, is, is just a thing and it's examining our relationship to what is that tangible representation of, a, of an exchange of energy mean to us because it's the emotions around it that are going to affect how you handle it and, and what it does for you too. You spent, you spent a significant part of your prof professional career building a $2.5 billion money management business from scratch which is super, super, super impressive. What has been your view on money? Like, is it, it, it sounds like not quite full on capitalist, Wall Street, dog eat dog, but then it's not the artist, money doesn't matter either. Is it somewhere middle of the road? Um, yeah, I think, I think the reason that I'm a good investor, well, there are, I mean, there are a bunch of reasons why I'm a good investor, but I think one reason was that it, it wasn't um, super emotionally loaded for me. So what, what I mean by that, and I was thinking about this recently because I, I wrote, I, I posted an essay about this, is in 1987, right, I remember going home from, from Black Monday. And I was living in the Upper West Side at the time. And I, you know, I went home and I'm like, I don't know, I lived around the corner from Say Bar as I went to go get like something to eat or something. You know, and everyone, I saw these like, young guys walking around Broadway, you know, the ties are askew, the hair is sticky. I mean, like they're shell shocked, right? And, and I had been, yeah, I was working for Chuck Rice at the time as a small cap value manager. And, you know, he was buying money hand over fist. So, you know, we occasionally we'd go look at the Quotron and go, wow, <laughs> you know. And, but the atmosphere in the office was completely calm, right? And, and it was kind of, it was only when I went out in the street that I realized that there had been an event that really shook people up, right? And same thing in like 2008, I think there were a lot of, I mean, I'd hear stories about managers who just went MIA, they went missing in action, like their clients couldn't get in touch with them. They just like were in some kind of, you know, they, they just were paralyzed, right? And, and I, 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 I really think what made me good is that I'm really comfortable with a lot of uncertainty and a lot of change and that you're constantly responding to change or you're, you're, you know, you have to both, you have to have strong convictions weakly held, right? You have to have a strong point of view and a, and a real case. But then if something comes in that tells you you're wrong, like you can't get egotistical about it. <laughs> you're like, okay, I was wrong, <laughs> you know, and you move on. So I think part of the reason I was good is I'm wired a little differently. You know, so I think people can also look, particularly when you're managing a lot of money, the dollars can get staggering. But so you have to really think in percentages too, you know, because if it's a 3% loss as opposed to $30 million, right? You got a context into everything. So I think that was, that's one of the reasons. I mean, you know, there are many other ones, but um, I think that helped a lot. I'm, I'm a little, 
wired a little differently. I speak very hyperbolically, <laughs> but I invest pretty cold heartedly, I guess. Well, you got to get, you, you have to like express that somewhere. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Get it out of your system. <laughs> then you could be like, eh, you, know, you know, the sun will rise tomorrow. You know, you have to have perspective. Since we first met, I've really looked up to you for your very disciplined investing process. When there are days like Black Monday or a year like 2008, because small caps, your space, the pool that you swam in or you swim in, not for the faint of heart. Those, those small caps are extremely volatile when there's a market crash. Yeah, yeah. How do you try to, like, how are you not as impacted as those guys with their ties askew <laughs> walking down the street and they look like they've been hit by a bus. Like, how do you, how do you, how do you kind of insulate yourself from that? So I think I was lucky in a couple of respects. One is that our clients were very sophisticated institutional investors and we were a very small part of their overall portfolio. So, they had, and so I was hired to do something very, very specific, and I was hired to do it over a long time horizon, and I was hired to beat my benchmark, right? So, so it was like if I did better than a Russell 2000, you know, so if the market was down 10%, and if the Russell was down 10%, and we were down eight, like we were heroes, right? So, so all of those things help to kind of keep a long term perspective on things. Um, I, I think the other thing about small caps is. Smaller companies, and it was interesting because I was just sort of going over some data around the 2008, 2009. Small caps, you know, the, the overall market kind of bottomed in March of 2009. Like, I think we all who've been in this business line, right? Remember that moment? That was the bottom. March 9th on my birthday. Right. My, yeah, mine is March, I'm March 8th. So we're, we're like almost birthday pin. And the small caps bottomed in November. You could see that in the stats because everyone pitches out the small stuff. They hold on to like Apple, you know, and then when they give up on Apple is when, you know, like it's time to buy. Right. So it, it's, it's really interesting, but, but because it's of a long-term thing and also smaller companies can be more nimble, they can act faster. So there are more opportunities to kind of, for them to make hay while there's disarray in the world too. So part of it is, is, and I, I had a client who would always come to talk to me because you know, whenever like the world was falling apart, I was so excited right? <laughs> and everybody else would be like, and, and so he, I was kind of his inverse barometer <laughs> for the market because, uh, you know, whenever things are really great, I'd be like, Oh, I don't know, man. I don't know. A lot of things could go wrong. You know, but when things were terrible, I was so excited because I could buy a lot of stuff and I could buy it really well. You know, and that's not the time to be going further down below the barrel. You know, that's when you actually, you know, buy the thing that looks relatively more expensive, but has like twice the quality, right? So I think, I, I, I think part of it was just, was just because it meant so much opportunity, you know, because I really believe that, I mean, the times of the biggest dislocation are the times when you can make the most money, you know, and I know you know that because you've been, you've, been around the block a few times too. I have more and more gray hair to show for it. <laughs> right? In those times of market dislocation, do you tend to have cash available to deploy? So we had to run fully invested, which meant we really weren't meant to have more than 10% in cash at any given time. So, uh, and the amount of cash was strictly a byproduct of our new idea flow. So we're really running a pretty concentrated portfolio of no more than 35 stocks. Um, in, you know, in no less than 25. And in practice, it was mainly around 30, 30 to 33 stocks. Um, and it was really a function of the cash was if we felt we had to sell more stuff because it was time to do that. And maybe before we had some new ideas, our cash balances would go up and down. But basically we were running fully invested all the time. So it was because what happens, this is what happened. If you're the freaking genius who like perfectly top takes the market and goes to 100% cash, right? And you time it perfectly. If you're that person, right? That's pretty hard to top, right? You're not gonna put it back to work in the market at the bottom. You know, you've been rewarded by putting it out. You know what I mean? It's kind of like you've won seven gold medals already. 
<laughs> now you just don't want to like jump back in the pool. Okay. And make an investment decision because it ain't going to be as good as that one. You know, so I think that's what's interesting is in a way, on one hand, you could argue everyone's gone to like a fully invested buy and hold strategy. And really maybe the value and the art would come in like doing some asset allocation decisions around that. But I think it's just too difficult. And, 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 you know, I'm sure you've seen the research too, right? If you miss a few key days, like your returns are completely affected by that. It's much worse to be not in the pool um, uh, and miss those big moves. Um, you know, not to say that you can't be in the equivalent bear market for a long time, but there's usually like bear market rallies in there too. Sorry, Andy, I realize my propensity to like not give a short answer is really probably not good in the podcast. No, no, it's great. I like it. I love it. The less work I have to do, the better. So thank you. <laughs> okay. Give us a little bit of background because I know that you went to Princeton. Mm -hmm. You didn't really study money management, but I think even if you did study finance, they're not really teaching you the skills, like how to manage money anyway. Yeah. So give us a little background about how you developed your approach. One thing that I love about this business is that there's so many different ways to do things. It's not one way. So how did you develop your way? Um, so I'd say definitely at the time I went, like now they have financial engineering and they're very strong in, in, in quantitative investing. Um, when I went there, I think the only practical class for undergraduates other than architecture was, I think, one accounting class, um, which I thought could, I could cram. <laughs> and I learned that you can't cram accounting. It's kind of like learning a language. You, you, you kind of got to do the homework every week. <laughs> anyway, um, what happened is when I started, so I, I had trouble breaking into the business. I decided I didn't want to go to law school. Um, I, was, I had two paths. One was to be an investigative journalist because my idea was I wanted to keep learning and then applying what I learned. And the other thing was investing, that I knew that that would also be the case. So you can leverage your experience, but like every day is different because the world is different. And you're also connecting the dots and your, uh, you know, whatever you're learning is, is not wasted ever. Um, I worked for somebody who was a portfolio manager and it was kind of one of those deals of like, I'll teach you and you just got to do everything around the office or whatever. And I did that. And then I went to, took all my practical education at night at NYU, at the Institute of Finance, at Columbia, um, and kind of got, got the technical education. And then I studied for the CFA and did that. Um, early on, I worked for Chuck Royce, who's a deep value investor. Um, and so I learned a lot from him. And then I also had a mentor when I started the firm before, when I joined, I partnered up with someone who, who did another money management firm startup before, Deluma. And his mentor uh, is a guy named Andy Knuth, who's a really, really great small cap um, value investor as well. And that's where from Royce, who had hundreds of positions, I learned that I really prefer to concentrate in portfolio. Not so concentrated that it's too volatile and too much risk, but concentrated where every position really mattered, right? And you could have a nice mix. Um, and so I, I would say that's, I got the sort of focus on, and if you're going to be paid for active management, you better actively manage. And if you're going to actively manage, that means you have to be concentrated. And you have to, your stock beds need to matter. But I also didn't like having 10% positions. I just don't think, you know, you gotta really think you're right. And whenever you sure you're right is when you're guaranteed to be wrong, <laughs> as you know, right? So every position was, you know, three to 5%, 6% tops, that kind of thing. So it was kind of really walking that line. And part of that, I think I got in reaction to working with Chuck, who is a really great, you know, and who's built an incredible business doing it. But I really liked the intellectual challenge of, of like really everything mattered all the time. Uh, and then from Andy Knuth, I really kind of learned, um, you know, that part of it, I guess I would say, like more of the sort of looking for the rates of change and, and the handicapping things and stuff as well. A little growthier. He's a little growthier than Chuck. So I really 
develop my approach from uh, from old school apprenticeship, which I don't think is done so much anymore in our business. Because also too, like I graduated in 1983. I mean, you know, sure, the people went into investment banking training programs, but it wasn't Wall Street, hedge fund, you know, it wasn't the ticket to like riches that people thought. So it was kind of a very different uh, industry. Yeah, I see that fund flows and like things are changed. Things have changed a lot because there's quantitative trading. There's all this computer driven trading these days, electronic. And then also fund flows seem to all be going towards index funds. Yeah. And there's less talk about bottom up research and stock selection. Yeah. Which is interesting because I remember, I don't know if you remember, I remember when value investors, like I think it was around 2000, like right in the late 90s, and when like value investors were just leaving the business in droves. <laughs> they couldn't figure out the market, it made no sense to them, getting paid on eyeballs. I mean, you know, there are whole generations of money managers like quit, right? Um, and uh, so it, it's interesting because I think. Whenever you have an extreme, right, the opposite starts to, to, to matter. And I was reminded of this because I just bear with me. I was reading an article in the Chicago Tribune about how baseball was changed by Moneyball, right? It got very statistic and everything else, right? And so then the level of stolen bases went down. Pitchers weren't paying attention to it. The, the style of pitching changed, so it made it hard. So what happened is people started are starting to steal bases again. Because everything was so optimized the other way, right? It, it, it actually created the opportunity. Because pitchers, the way they pitch, makes it harder for the catcher to be able to like jump up and like throw somebody out. Pitchers aren't checking the runners the way they used to, you know? And so it, it, it really, like there's a, the, the, everybody following the numbers, right? And doing the textbook way has created the opportunity for, for, for doing better. And I think, I think that's what we're going to find, possibly, with when everything is indexed, right? Non-indexing. And I really, there's a lot, especially for sort of amateur investors, <laughs> I would say, right? Um, I think indexing makes so much sense. And I think if you want to learn how to invest and, and, and you, can, you can learn gradually putting a little bit of money to work in individual stocks that you believe in or you can, you know, you can learn how to evaluate them. Um, there's so much noise in the system though, the signal to noise ratio from all that short-term trading, from the short-term, you know, um, everybody wants more return, but with less risk and with less fall. <laughs> <laughs> like it just doesn't, you know, you can't do that. You just can't. So, I, you know, so I do feel like there were some, there have been some real structural changes to the market. And I wouldn't say it's for the better. I think it's made it harder to hear the signal. It's made for more opportunity. It also means like you really need a stronger stomach and you really need to be even more disciplined. Uh, and that longer term horizon could pay you well. Because I think at the end of the day, and this isn't even with talking about crypto, right? At the end of the day, right? At the end of the day, the cash flows of a company matter. They will matter. And temporarily, they cannot matter. But at the end of the day, that is kind of the last, unless you decide it doesn't matter at all anymore, but that's a core principle of finance, right? That it's the, the cash flow. And all we're doing is trying to guess at what that number is going to be at some point in time and whether it's, and discounting it properly. I mean, it's a very messy and imprecise and, and kind of very theoretical exercise. Right? But at the end of the day, what a company generates in, in free cash flow should be what matters. Yeah, so I think you get back to that. Sometimes. Yeah, the work that you were doing, it, it, it was also, it's like, are Wall Street's estimates for that cash flow, for the earnings, for the revenue, was that, uh, be, was that being underestimated? And could you find opportunities where you felt like there was a lot more upside because it wasn't being recognized currently? 
Yeah, and I, I think also, I mean, we forget because we think numbers tell us that, and numbers are like a hard truth, right? But you have to, companies will have, management will have to, will take a lot of actions or a landscape might change, right? And there's a lot of qualitative evidence that comes through before it actually translates into the numbers. And if you're a sell side analyst, right, having to project, you know, right, crafting things, people by nature, we tend to sort of extrapolate linearly, right? And there's kind of, why take the career risk, right, of saying, oh my God, they're going to blow up their numbers this quarter. Um, so I think it's really, particularly when there are inflection points, um, it's, it's easy, it, it, it's, it's easy to underestimate. I mean, it's the same way that like market strategy, like no one ever is right about their predictions for the economy and stuff. These are complex dynamic systems. But I think if you couldn't find out that like, if you change how you pay your sales force, that they only get paid if the business is profitable, say, your profits are probably going to go up. Your sales might go down because the sales are harder, right? But when you kind of recover from that, the profit, the mix of your business is going to be different. It's not in the numbers yet, but you can kind of handicap that what the effects going to be. So that's the sort of thing that, that we would look for all the time. And then also too, like the street being, you know, sometimes you just got to invest. You can't run a business quarter to quarter. That's the thing I think is like so sad. You really can't run the business quarter to quarter. And you certainly can't run the business to just make Wall Street happy and get your stock, cash in on your stock options, right? It's just stupid, right? Because you have, you know, I think of a business like an ecosystem. So you have customers, you have vendors, right? You have your employees, right? You, you serve a lot of, you serve a lot of constituents. And I think Wall Street, I mean, this, I have real issues with this whole, like, worshiping at the altar, the altar of shareholder value, right? Because if you maximize for shareholder value, if you maximize for certain, like, you know, CFROI, like return on investment, capital, you maximize for any one thing, right? You're going to affect other things. And you can have huge value-destroying unintended consequences that just happen to be a little further out in the future, Right? And, and so it was just driving me crazy because if you just take care of the shareholders, guess what? Your customers are going to walk away. Your employees are going to get pissed off. <laughs> you know, it's not healthy. You got to you, you got to manage it in this way. So sorry, that was my soapbox rant. That is a delicate ecosystem and a lot of variables and a lot of things to juggle. You clearly have a deep knowledge of companies cash flow the leadership the valuation are those things important to the average retail investor or maybe what are some of the things that you know that the average person can apply to their money and their investments like what are those important lessons that are meaningful to them that's not just important to like an institutional mandate that's very specific? That's a really good question. I think, um, so if you're investing mattress money, right? Like money that you're really not going to need. This is like money that you can put away for decades. Finding the companies that are leaders in new technologies or new um, um, new, yeah, I guess technologies. I mean, I'm thinking of like applied bio in 1990, you know, where, you're, where they, made, they made the PCR machines and like, you know, it's just like you could see that there was a whole big industry that was coming behind it. Or um, so, 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 or like Genentech back in its day or like biotech, back, you know, like the early people were in biotech. And a lot, or sometimes when there's like a new industry, like when cable first started, like Wall Street didn't understand at all because the cash flow numbers were horrific, right? And, but the minute you had built out your infrastructure, it was going to be a cash cow, crazy. But 
it was a new business model and people were like not being able to figure it out. So I think for, for a retail investor, when you're really looking out, take over the long term, finding the people who are doing new things and are doing it with a lot of momentum isn't quite the right word, but you can you can sort of tell that there's a flywheel effect, right? right? That Walmart at a certain point, which is going to keep Walmarting its way across America, right? Um, so, and and I, I would say that like like paying attention to not trying to sort of find which oil and gas company is better right now or which one has the best deal. Um, prospects or, or, or that kind of very inside baseball, but more like the bigger bets of, um, uh, you know, is artificial intelligence going to matter, keep mattering more and more with every passing year? I think the answer is yes, right? So then you go and say, all right, well, who's doing that? Right? And, and it matters almost less exactly how expensive it is because the market like tithes will take care of it to some extent, you know, and cause you're making a bet on like which horse is going to win the race, but like 30 years out. Now, the other thing is life cycles of companies are getting more compressed. Our world is just getting faster. So, you know, maybe, you know, maybe it's not like I'm going to buy IBM and hold it forever. <laughs> you see people who kind of grow up with that mindset. So I, I, I think that's what you do is, is, and especially if it's an area or a field that you know something about and you are interested in and you kind of know reputationally um, what these, you know, who's crushing it in, in the market, in your industry, that's also another thing to do. But I would go for the, for the, not the new speculative kind of, super cutting edge, but the ones where like the knife, you know, like the blade of the knife ha has been honed and it is cutting. It is cutting through the marketplace and changing things. Um, so you don't need to be like right at the beginning, but I think, I think, I think, so that, that's what I would do as a retail investor today, you know, start to teach myself or be taught how to, how to value and think about think about stocks, but that would be what I would look for, the kinds of things that are going to be the genetics of tomorrow, the, the apples of tomorrow, that kind of thing. Yeah, looking for mega trends and trying yeah. to identify who are the established players leading those yeah. big changes. Yeah. Where does Thank crypto you. fit you in there? You said that much faster than I did. <laughs> you mentioned crypto for a second. Where does that fit in, do you think? You know, I, it's so interesting because to, and putting aside the whole blockchain and, and DeFi and decentralization, you know, the kind of empowerment of, of the individual versus institutions, like putting aside and, and putting aside that because, you know, as we've all seen, it's not completely um, uh, foolproof, right? But conceptually, in a way, as, a, as an investment, crypto is kind of logical conclusion about all the structural changes that have gone on in the marketplace, right? Where, where the derivative of the derivative, like you get trades are not, like you're not buying, you're not, people are, are, are trading not the derivative of the, on, the, on, the, on the thing, right? But the derivative of, on the derivative of the derivative of the thing. So it's gotten to this absurd kind of level. And then you get back to this point, and I was reading an article, and I don't remember where, but talking about how for, you know, for a lot of the young, people who are young, who are in a very different position in terms of like the level of student debt they have, about what their job prospects are like. I mean, you know, it's just, it's just it's a lot harder now, right? Because we're in this sort of mature economy. And, you know, they're like, what the hell? Like, why not treat it like a lottery ticket? Why not like, how, you know, it, it, cause it's kind of like, it's not gonna matter. If I do like the, the textbook stuff, it's not going to matter as much. Why not? I, why not take a flyer on some stuff? So in a way, all the stuff that's been happening, like you know, since I started in the business in '83, right? All those trends. This is just a logical conclusion of that. Like, what is value anyway? <laughs> you know? 
you know, what, what does it mean? Like, how do you, you know, like, what does it stand, you know, that kind of stuff. The whole idea, the other idea of it being a place for, as a, as a hyperinflationary hedge for people who live in countries who, who, who have lived experience of the wheelbarrows full of cash, like Venezuela, you know, right? So, I mean, that's a real thing. So, you know, hyperinflation is not like, oh, that was just Germany between with the world wars. This is happening today. So I think the combination of that, the combination of, of having a, a system that is outside of the man, so to speak, right, uh, has a lot of appeal. It, it just hasn't been completely foolproof. So I find it really fascinating and I'm, I'm reading, I'm, I don't have, I haven't done anything in crypto, but I'm learning. You know, and that's part of the fun of being in Twitter. <laughs> My age is I get to kind of learn <laughs> from, from people. There's a lot, you know, going on. Um, so I don't know. I don't know yet, but it's in a way it seems to me perfectly like it doesn't surprise me that this is where we are, that it got invented. So to speak. Yeah, I'm in the same boat. I'm learning because I feel like there's so much to learn. And if you're trying to identify major trends over the next 20, 30 years, crypto and blockchain can certainly fit right in there. So you have to keep learning and doing your homework so that you understand what's happening. Yeah, and, and I think also, I mean, there are gonna be more and more blockchain applications that make a lot of sense too. I mean, it just, yeah. The other thing too is I do know, I do know of someone um, who actually manages crypto assets the way you would manage a portfolio. So using a modern portfolio theory on crypto assets, which is kind of interesting. So, um, yeah. Um, I actually would like to talk to him some more about that. You probably would too, actually. I would too. You know, how I the hell do you do this? You know, how do you hedge? I, I saw one of your blog posts on your website and the title is How to Invest Like a Girl and beat the pants off the guys. Yeah. <laughs> I have two daughters. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I absolutely. And um, uh, and I wasn't just being clickbaity, actually, because what, what drives me crazy now is, because um, uh, I, I work with a lot of you know small business owners and, and um, a lot of them are women and they know so much more about money or they have like their lack of confidence relative to, to their competency is like maddening, right? But like, and Vanguard and Fidelity both recently put out uh, studies of their clientele, right? And there's always been this kind of, and, and this, the research has shown that women, broadly speaking, are better investors in them. And, but like yet so many women say, oh, I don't know anything about money. But, uh, you know, the way we're socialized sometimes doesn't always help us. <laughs> In this case, it does. The, what was interesting to me about these latest studies is there's been kind of this notion that, oh, well, women are more risk averse than men. It turned out to not be the case at all. But here's where the edge came in, and this actually fits in with prior research. Too. Women traded less often than men. So they not only they traded like half as much. And they checked their accounts far less often. So if there were like, I don't know, 24% of men checked their balances every day, like maybe 8% of women did, right? So the women were taking the long term, they weren't making themselves crazy by going, oh, I'm $10,000 poor today. Oh, oh, look, I made $5,000 today, you know, right? Because I mean, because the more you pay attention to something, the more you're going to be tempted to mess with it, right? Again, so, so they would check it quarterly or, or less frequently. So part of it is they just traded less often. They were also um, more diversified, too. So they had a better, their asset allocation was more, was more balanced. So they used a bit more, um, uh, you know, uh, what do you call them, those funds, target date funds. They used uh, a bit more balanced funds. They had more of a balance of fixed income. So it was less that they had cash and they had a little bit more fixed income, which right now you could argue could <laughs> be more dangerous than equities, but that's another company. That's another go uh, conversation. So they tended to be, you know, and they tended to, so they were more long-term oriented. They were less, by not checking all the time, less, you're going to not make yourself fall prey to the common psychological traps again in the way of investing. 
Uh, and they were kind of well diversified, which meant that they could probably also create less, you know, volatility in their in their um, in their results than, than they would otherwise. So, um, and the other thing is that you know there is still a gender gap in terms of the balances, um, and. You know, uh, and what, what what also really struck me is how many people wish they'd started earlier. Do you? I think that's also like a big message to get out there is, is the power of compounding is real, right? The same way that debt can compound and crush you. Right? Starting small and just investing and just getting in that habit can really pay off in the long haul. Like huge. You know, so yeah, so so women are just, they tend to do their homework. They, they're just less emotional. Right, much less emotional, um, and uh, um, you know they're they're kind of more more disciplined. So, I and I think basically that's kind of the answer to a lot of things. Is if you're disciplined about your approach and consistent and disciplined, and with a long-term horizon, you're you're going to do well. You know, um, it almost matters less exactly what your style is, and more that you're showing up and you're doing it consistently matters it's um i guess no surprise that removing the emotion as much as you can from your investing process is going to be a good thing in the same way that buying a car emotionally is probably not a good thing either um you know it takes that rational side of your brain rather than <laughs> shooting from the hip and saying i need this right now yeah yeah, no, I think I think that's part of it. And I think also, um, you know, I think you can't remove emotions from good decision making ever because, you know, so I, ha I have this thing because I, ha I have like one essay about like how like being like Spock is good and then another essay about how like not being like Spock is good. Because, um, you know, they've shown like people who've had a damage to the part of the brain where that removes the, the, um, uh, the emotional part of, of decision making, like call it your gut you know, instincts, um, make bad decisions, really bad decisions. Because you can make a logically sound decision that's a really bad decision, and it's your judgment, your gut, that tells you, no, that's a bad decision. Um, on the other hand, if you're just reacting in the moment, right, if you don't have a plan, if you're just reacting in the moment, or if, like, you know, uh, or there's a dopamine hit. Like, I've seen people do this, like, with, 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 with options, or, like, a margin, rather, you know, like, there's a stock, and, they have a hot stock tip and, and they put, you know, and it's so easy to like put money on margin and, and they're making money, they're making money and they feel like a million bucks, right? And then boom, like the earnings come out, the stock tanks and they have, you know, stuff is sold out from under them because it's margin. It's not like they're like, okay, let me, I can't average down or I'll recover in two years, right? Is, or, you know, it's just, they're wiped out. It's, Yeah. So that's the emotional piece, because if you're not prepared for that, you're going to make stupid decisions in the moment. I feel Sorry. like when making a decision, you need to make a decision based on your brain, your heart, but you do need that gut check, gut check also. I interviewed a performance coach, Don Green, who would coach these Juilliard music students who would get so nervous for their uh, auditions. and he also trained big Wall Street traders. And when it was the Wall Street traders, he was like, what was the difference between the guys or the, the guys and women who could trade with longevity and they're making these huge bets. And he's like, they do all the research. They did the analytical work, but they also had to do the gut check because that instinct served them well. Mm -hmm. Because there's so much pattern recognition that your subconscious, because, you know, 95% of our beings are powered by our unconscious mind, which yeah. takes in a lot and, and um, can, can see things, right? So it's the same. I mean, we've seen this time and again with, like, experts um, on, like, looking at fake artifacts or fake art, right? It's like they just, it looks wrong, right? And... It's almost like it's not that they're going through a mental checklist necessarily, particularly if the forgery is really, really good. It's just it's off because the way it kind of vibes is off. But that's what the vibing is like pattern recognition, too. Um, 
And, and the other thing, though, I've seen that can happen is people can do a lot of research and they get really stuck in their own heads about it, right? It's like, this thing is worth $13.22, a penny less, right? You know, and the market's telling you it's not worth eight bucks, right? It doesn't matter, like, how right your math is or, or whatever. Like, the market is telling you something, right? It may be temporarily wrong in the market, or you may be wrong, right? But if you're sure you're right, you're not going to bother to find out why. Because when you find out why, with a truly open mind, beginner's mind, when you find out why, that's when you know whether you should be buying the, you know, the, the bejesus out of it at eight bucks, or whether you should be cutting your losses and running, right? But if you do it from the place of I'm wrong and the market's wrong, I get, you know, Mr. Market, as a friend of mine used to say, it's designed to make, give the maximum number of people the maximum amount of pain. <laughs> so, yeah, same way. If you fight reality, reality would always win. So, you know, sometimes I've seen people just get the collective mindset around something is just wrong. Um, and I saw that in Pandora years and years ago. Like everyone was so, you know, and they were going through a transition where they were like, becoming like a radio station in their business model, how they sold ads. So they had to invest in the sales force. They had to invest in this. They had to get the metrics to be able to sell ads the way that a radio station sells ads, right? And you were coming towards the end of that investment period. So all of a sudden you were going to get rates. You were going to get like local, you know, and you had a lot of control over, over your geography in a way that you didn't in radios. So you could get premium for that. You know, they were, their, their business model, you know, they had to spend money to do this. But everyone was just so fixated on, uh, I don't know what the metric of the day, I can't remember exactly, but whether it was new, new subs or, or the streams or whatever. And I remember going to a meeting and there had to be like 20, 20 people in that meeting and they were all short the stock. <laughs> Right. Uh, and, and, and they were all these hedge funds and they were all, right, and they were all short to start and they're asking these questions six ways you mean you could just sort of see the talk profession but it was like so clear what they were doing and they were very explicit about what they were doing right and you either were like does that make sense does it not make sense and sure enough the minute the inflection point translated into the numbers there was a huge pivot you know in the stock took off right but it's been, it was, it was a kind of a weird situation for me to be in a room where every single person in that room was short and sure, like hostile and nasty and sure that they were right. You know? But for that, at that moment in time, what was going on with Pandora was not what they were saying. Did you view that as a positive when everybody else in the room was so negative? Yeah, absolutely. Because it didn't take much to, to um, you know, if I had confidence that, that, that the numbers were going to fall out of bed and they'd been doing this long enough that you were like in the eighth inning, you know, this wasn't like you were just starting this process, you were long enough in, in it that you could put a time frame on it, you could size it. So it was, you know, it wasn't just sort of bending against the, the hordes just for the sake of it. I mean, it was, there was, there was a, an investment case around it. But you had to, you know, you had to believe. I mean, you had to do that. But it was so interesting to me. Yeah, actually, when I think about it, it was, it, it just made me feel more excited about the opportunity. Um, not that I like to, you know, necessarily go up against you know, the barbarians. <laughs> but but uh, in that case, I really felt, I really felt, you know, confident. Mariko, you closed Daruma Capital Management in 2019. Talk us through some of the emotions of closing a successful business of 25 years. Um, so it was hard. Um, and it was hard on a lot of different levels, um, partly because it was sort of my, you know, it was my life, my performance art. It was, you know, I, I had a lot of, you know, I really wanted to do it a certain way. Um, and a couple of things happened, you know, we had a pretty concentrated book of business, like some, you know, a handful of really large clients who managed money very well for a long time. We've gone through, you know, a tough performance, you know, P 
period where we do well and, and you know we lag and we do well, well. And I had also I was also really burnt out, and I think I didn't realize at the time that I was. And you know it's really hard. So it was kind of like the harder I worked, the less effective I was. <laughs> I think it's a definition of burnout. I now realize. <laughs> you know, I should have checked the literature sooner, right? Um, and you know, I had I had a partner who who pretty much from the beginning, and then she had retired, and, and then I was running kind of everything for a while, and then I just really needed help, and I brought in help, and that help created a lot of. Um, a lot of infrastructure. So then, because then, like, the kind of stuff we can't do is very creative, right? I mean, you do a lot of analysis, but it's, 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 it's art, right? It's not managing people. I'm a terrible manager. <laughs> and, and I was having death by meeting. And meanwhile, I'm like, I'm the stock picker. So, so that was like a mistake, clearly. Um, and but, you know, I think what happens is, and what happened is so, so, you know, I mean, the writing was on the wall for a while, but um, then just sort of the, the, the big clients, you know, pull the plug. And then I had to, I would have had to rebuild from a small base, right? which I could have done. But at that point, I'm just physically exhausted. And uh, mentally, I, I hadn't realized quite how exhausted I was as well, too. So, you know, I, I closed the business and I was actually very lucky. I had another friend who had done something similar in, in his business and it was really helpful to have him as a sounding board actually going through this. Um, and I'm really glad that I did because I think that business was literally the way it was structured and just, you know, because I had not, this is what I'm teaching. <laughs> business owners now, right? How to run your business in a way that you're in right relationship with them so that it's generative and sustainable and not that like you're bleeding, <laughs> you're giving blood constantly. And then you know, one day you're like, there's no blood left, right? So it's like, how do you do it where you're like this, you know, endless fountain of vitality and, and generating, you know, business energy as opposed to like you run, the well runs dry, right? Um, and uh, so anyway, I think I realized that <laughs> that's what I did. And I could have done that differently. Uh, but now I get to tell other people <laughs> to learn from my negative example. <laughs> yeah, tell, talk about what you're doing now because your LinkedIn now says business mentor and life coach. It also says chief cook and bottle washer. A couple of things. Like I have, um, so I'm kind of doing both business mentoring and I guess it's kind of, kind of life coaching, but my, my clients are in two groups. One are like people in a shit storm, right? Where they really need somebody who understands business. Uh, and uh, usually, you know, like maybe there's a family business situation or trust and estate situation or divorce situation. There's like stuff where they need support to figure out what they want and clarity, um, help in managing the helping managing the sort of service providers, right? Communicating that clarity and managing the, the lawyers and the accountants. Uh, and also just help kind of assessing what's really going on um, and feeling good about that. So um, that's, that's one group. So pretty sophisticated kind of intersection of you need a sounding board and you're, you're going through a shift so you don't have to go through it alone, but if there, you need a certain amount of business and analytical kind of sophistication as well as, as psychological and, and you know, emotional support. And then the other group of people I really help are people who are either want to take their side hustles and make them into their businesses or people who have started their businesses and I'm really helping them kind of figure out who have expressed their entire self through the business and how to have the business be that expression in a coherent way. So um, like running the business from the inside out, kind of what I was talking about too, like right, having it be generative as well. So, um, you know, if you're an acupuncturist and an herbalist, what, 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 what are your most deeply held beliefs? And how do you 
communicate that in the strongest, purest way, in a way that your custom, your 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 people, the people who really need what you have to offer, uh, can find you. And I think part of it too is we're all like one in seven billion, right? Our experience, our genetics, our socialization, you know, everything it is like we can have sort of similar backgrounds, but we're all completely unique, right? And how to how to run the sort of energy, the creative energy of your business through that prism of your uniqueness in a way that you kind of go through the world in a way in integrity and um, being yourself and, and and not just going like oh wait what's my target market but it's more like coming you know that way because this is sustainable from the inside out the other way can be very effective but it can be just tactics. Mm. It sounds part branding, but also the key to identifying what it is, like the essence of you and your business so that you can succeed and grow and be sustainable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's, you know, I, I find also that a lot of women business owners want to run their businesses differently the way that I did. Um, but we're also not trained if we want to do things more collaboratively, for example, right? We have to be comfortable with, it's much easier to hold people accountable in a hierarchical kind of military model. It's harder when it's collaborative, right? It's harder if you're socialized to be conflict avoidant. It's harder if you're socialized to kind of, you know, enable, right, to be the responsible one, you know, kind of the little red hen, right? And so if you want to do these other models, which tend to be, you know, there's more reinvestment in the community, there's more, you know, right? It's, 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 a, it's just a different model. If you want to do that, there are certain things uh, that you have to learn that we're not taught. And then the traditional kind of business tends to be in this command and control hierarchical form. So, if you, so I feel like there's a gap between some skills and awarenesses that are needed to run a model that is uh, more, you know, more yin, less yang, call it. Um, and I'm sort of thinking a lot about that and how, how, to, how, to, how to help that. Because there are certain things I really wish I had known when I was first starting out would have made things a lot easier. Mariko, I'd like to ask all the Inspired Money guests, how do you define success? Ah, um... I think success is really feeling like you have, um, um, oh, I know why. There's a thing missing. I'm like, why am I not hearing you properly? I'm going to take these off. <laughs> like, I unplugged myself. Um, so success, I think, is, is, is living. So I think we're all creators, right? I think the life force that animates us, whether you want to call it divine grace or chi or, right, just our aliveness, our just being alive is enough, right? And, but I feel like that creative life energy, like the way the corn just, you know, like it can't help it, a seed can't help it, it's just got to grow, that compulsion, right? That, so to me, success is, is allowing that and, and um, nurturing that and being able to sort of remove some of the blocks that life inevitably kind of injects us with those blocks, right? Um, you know, the trauma, the wounds, the bad experiences, and and that we, so to me, success is, is kind of um, uh, first and foremost, having a base level of self-acceptance and being in right relationship with yourself and your sovereignty and the rest of the world. Um, and that, 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 that the not living from a place of fear and scarcity, but really, you know, um, uh, but really living a full creative life and which has nothing to do with dollars and cents, right? I mean, you can be a postal worker and have a very successful life, right? So I'm not, you know, and on many levels, right? I mean, there's many good things about it. It's predictable. It's a good income, good pension, right? I mean, there's a lot of stuff around it. And it's also hard physical work too. But um, so for me, success is more 
Achieving your potential sounds really kind of gross, <laughs> right? Because it's like, what is potential anyway? But it's more like unbinding your mind and unleashing your heart and just like fully living, you know, with all the good highs and lows that come with that, but not like stifling your creative. And when I say creative, I mean your life force, the full expression of you. You live this life as fully as you can. I am incapable of a short answer. <laughs> Beautifully said. Well, thank you for sharing your investing insights, your thoughts on money, your thoughts on creativity. Tell everyone where they can follow you and read your writings, because I love your writings, which is an expression of your creativity. Oh, well, great. Thank you. So actually, I have, this is, I wrote, this is a, my Eight Times Up is a collection of essays that I wrote when I was running Daruma. So they're kind of like little mini personal essays, but with all an investing lesson in them. And um, you can download it for free on my website, which is marikogordon.com under publications. Uh, I'm also on Twitter uh, and on Medium. So I'm Mariko Gordon on Medium. I'm on Facebook. Um, and Twitter, um, my handle is Marika Gordon CFA. I'll put that all in the show notes. Yeah. yeah, that'd be great. That'd be great. Thank you so much, Andy. I really had so much fun talking the story with you. <laughs> it's always great. Um, totally unplugged. <laughs> so what was your favorite Inspired Money moment? In Mariko's words, the power of compounding is real in the same way that debt can compound and crush you. Start by investing small, and getting into that habit can really pay off over the long haul. Listen back to this episode and see how you can be a more disciplined investor. Bonus points for being less emotional, and don't forget that very important gut check. If you had a different favorite Inspired Money moment, let me know by posting a comment below. Thanks for watching to the end. I want to invite you to subscribe to my email that goes out every two weeks. The Runnymede investment team highlights data, news, and events that we think are worth sharing. Subscribe at inspiredmoney.fm slash newsletter. It's free and informative. Thanks for joining me on this mission. Have an inspired week and do something that scares you because that's where the magic happens.